Hello, fellow singers, and welcome to the maiden voyage of what is to be a series of podcasts from VoiceCouncil.com. My name is Mark Baxter, and as your host for this series, we're going to cover everything under the sun about singing. But I thought it best to start out with the one thing everybody wants. Everybody wants to sing high! Woo! You know it's true. Since the beginning of time, it seems every singer on the planet has lusted after just one higher note than their range provides. Now, I promise I won't always be talking like I'm jacked up on Red Bull and amphetamines, but I've got to get you pumped up for this subject, because if you struggle singing high, that means you have a lot of restrictive beliefs about your voice. I know I can help, but it's up to you to be willing to explore the unknown. For the past 35 years, I have helped thousands and thousands of singers as a strength and conditioning coach for The Voice. And what I've noticed over the years is that there's a whole lot of unknowns when it comes to the relationship between a singer and his or her voice, which is kind of strange when you think of it. Every musician I know, guitar players know every nut and bolt on that instrument, same with drummers, sax players, yet we singers were born with our instrument. It's a part of our body, and there's so much unknown as to how it works mechanically and how it corresponds with the laws of sound. Now, we call this instrument our voice, but it's actually a bunch of different parts, so let's go over the anatomy a little bit. If you run your finger right down your throat, let it stop your index finger. Put it right in the middle of your throat. And if you swallow, you'll feel a little lumpy item inside there go up. And if you yawn, you'll feel that same little lump in your throat go down. That little lump you're feeling is called the thyroid cartilage. And it's the basic house of the larynx. There's another cartilage underneath that called the cricoid cartilage. And that's the foundation of the larynx. It's attached to your windpipe. Now, the, the larynx is the vibrator of our instrument. And that's act that acts just like a drum head or a guitar string or the strings in a piano or the reeds on a saxophone or any wind instrument. In other words, it just creates a sound. Every acoustic instrument has four parts to it, if you will. And the actuator is what triggers the sound. And of course, in our in our voice, it is the air. The air streaming by the vocal folds triggers them into vibration. The folds themselves are the vibrator, and then all the airspace around, the windpipe underneath, and the pharynx is the name of the stretch of throat just above the larynx before it gets into your oral cavity. That area is a major resonator for us, and the oral cavity and nasal cavities also are resonators. And then your lips and tongue become articulators. So we have an actuator, creates the sound, vibrator is the source of the sound, a resonator enhances, and then the shaping of the sound is done by articulators. The independence of all of these parts is key for singers because you can't have a resonator act as a regulator. And that's very common when we're trying to sing high notes, that we overdrive the vibrator, your vocal folds, too much air pressure, and that causes the throat to respond to that excess force. It closes off that very vital resonator and begins to choke off the sound. We read this as a, as a warning signal that we're extending our range, and we, we either add more force or back up and say that our range can't hit it. And usually the, the backing off the force is a good idea, but that it's the end of your range is not true. So now let's talk about range. The vocal folds inside that thyroid cartilage are very small. The vibrator of your instrument is incredibly tiny. For females, it's 13 millimeters. It's like a half an inch. For guys, it's 19 millimeters. That's three quarters of an inch. That's a really small instrument especially when you think of the amount of force that we put on it to achieve those high notes. Now, there's three ways in which your voice can change pitch, and, and two of them aren't good. So the, the three ways are this. I want you to imagine a guitar. Now, the lowest string in the guitar is an E. The highest string is an E. 
and yet you can obviously hear the pitch difference between these two strings. And then there's four other strings in between. Now, if you don't know anything about guitars, just look at a picture of a guitar, and you'll notice that the string on one side of the line of strings is very thick, and the other on the other side of that line of strings is very thin. The low note is the thick one, the high note is the thin string. There is a reason for this. All the strings on a guitar are tensed at around the same amount. That allows for the neck to stay true. Yet, we want that extension of range from the lowest note to the highest note, and so we find that mass, the thickness of an item, really does contribute to the way that it vibrates. A high note is nothing more than a fast vibration. And we call it a high note because of the number of frequencies, the number of beats per second that something has to vibrate in order to create a pitch. A very low note is a low number, and a very high note is a high number of, of vibrations. That's all. And the problem here is that we're human, and so we tend to translate everything literally. So when we think about a high note, we tend to yank the larynx up the throat. We tend to look up, our eyes gaze up, our heads tilt up, and everything is all about reaching up the high note there, and yet the, the anatomy of your body is that high notes move horizontally. And that's the next way, uh, uh, besides mass, the next way that your larynx can change pitch is by stretching. And this is very important to remember. On a guitar, there are these tuning heads, and so I can raise or lower the pitch of a string by loosening or tightening the string. Now as I do this, I am adjusting the frequency, the number of beats that the string is vibrating per second. And the same thing happens with this little muscle in front of your larynx, there's two of them, called the cricothyroid muscles. And those act just like those tension knobs on a guitar. They tense or loosen the folds, thus producing a higher or lower note. Now the next way you can change pitch, and the reason it yanks up into your throat, is that we can shorten the resonator, and that will influence the frequency you're producing. Best example of this is a whistle. As I make a higher pitch, my tongue is sliding forward towards my lips, shrinking the cavity of my mouth, and thereby producing a higher pitch at the lips. Now, the larynx, we can increase or decrease the mass of the fold, produce a high note because it's the folds are so thin, and in conjunction with that, the fold has to be stretched by that cricothyroid muscle in front in order to produce a high frequency. Problem is, we can also increase that speed of the folds by increasing the air pressure, and that means it's going to get louder also, and like I said before, it also means it's going to trigger some neighboring muscle, usually. If we don't balance out these events, if we don't cor correctly attend or attune the folds to the right tension, if we don't feed those folds with the proper amount of air pressure, a balanced amount, a proportionate amount, and if we allow the larynx to rise up the throat, well, the, the larynx is also there as a swallowing mechanism. It protects your lungs from things invading down there. And so when the larynx rises up in the throat, a swallowing trigger is enacted, and that means your throat closes off. The epiglottis, which is a, a leafy uh, membrane, closes over the larynx. In other words, it begins to shut off your voice. The higher up your throat, the larynx rises. So we call it choking off the high note. It's very common because we tend to literally uh, approach these high notes by trying to raise the air pressure, raise the larynx, and of course, stretch the folds all at the same time. One action enacts or negates another. So the independence I'm talking about is the secret to singing a high note is starting with that very thin fold. Think of the high E string on a guitar. Now for guys, this is always a problem because in culture, in our culture, it's viewed as very taboo to make that, that very high sound with your voice. And so as we age, we tend to feel it's very immature to speak or sound that way. And same thing with females. It's always considered a more mature and authoritative sound if we speak and sing really rich tones and in a very low manner. A lot of times females will talk like this, which is just totally underfed, but that's 
now appreciated by females as a as an authoritative sound and yet it is the antithesis of what it takes to sing a high note okay so that's a very simple list of some of the parts needed to sing that's what makes up the instrument called the voice but i have a guitar and that doesn't necessarily make me a guitarist what makes you a singer is what's going on in your brain. That's truly the organ that sings. Each one of those parts I mentioned has many nerve endings, and those nerve endings are like telephone wires, and they extend down from the brain, sending with messages sent from above. And those messages originate from our culture, our belief systems, our esteem, our imagination, our creativity, and all collected together, we refer to all this as our thoughts and our feelings, our emotions and our intentions. And it's when these thoughts and feelings or emotions and intentions, when they conflict with each other, that's when we believe our voice has a problem. But it's really not the larynx, is it? It's, it's the telephone messages that are being sent down. Often, they sound like this. Try this. Don't try that. It might screw up. So what I've learned over the years is that all vocal restrictions begin and end in the mind. Free your mind and you free your voice. So it's easy to say these kind of things, but in practice, it's going to go against every tradition that you didn't know you had. What I'm suggesting is that you should be very playful with your voice. The best way to access your upper area of your voice, and I avoid using registers because, again, those only exist, those things called head register and chest register, they only exist in our minds. So if you want a borderless voice, stop thinking about it in sections. It's far better to think of your voice as this incredibly flexible, agile instrument that can make all those weird sounds you hear on Saturday morning cartoons. Yum, 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 yum. Boo, 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 boo. Hey, kitty, kitty, kitty. Hey, kitty, kitty, kitty. Those playful little sounds are the best access point into upper notes, into being able to sing higher. Because it's only after you gain some permission to be playful that those goofy little sounds can be more formal, as in specific pitches and lengths on specific vowels. So we take the goofy little stuff and it gives us access into those higher areas, typically that we block off because they'll sound foolish. Coo, coo, coo. Cool, cool. Then we can organize them into these specific pitches. But again, if there's any kind of a issue, coo, 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 and your voice tends to crack, we tend to recoil from this as if it's damaging to the folds when it's really just embarrassing to our reputation. So do this when you're alone. Play with your voice often whenever there's no one in earshot. It's too often we are compressed by the cultural taboo of sounding bad, and therefore we fail to explore the outer reaches of our voice, both in different timbres and tones and, and in obviously in its range. So give yourself the freedom of privacy. Coo, 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 coo. Take it as high as it will go comfortably. There is absolutely nothing to be gained by forcing a note to sing higher. Usually what happens there is that we're forcing the voice to stay in a single mass. We're forcing the folds to remain thick, that's i.e. chest register, and it's just simply, again, a, a, a thinking too far ahead. Now, if this sound it's not something you'll use on stage or in recording, then we deem it unworthy to pursue when actually it is the first thread that will unravel your high end into glorious rich high notes. But you've got to start with thin folds first. Yes, there's a taboo of singing girly if you're a guy or too thin if you're a female. But again, that's, that's jumping way ahead here and critiquing yourself on a performance aesthetic when you're just exploring. So important to just explore the voice.
Keep your volume very low when you're exploring those higher ranges. It's perfectly okay to sing along with the radio or sing along with any tracks you're listening to, but do so really softly, and you'll find that that puts your folds in a very thin, flexible state. And again, that flexible state is what's needed first, and then you can gradually bulk up the folds by asking for more volume. The same pitch... Sung softly, or I'll do it on an ah. When I increase the volume, that's really me increasing the thickness of the fold. I'm matching that with the proportionate amount of air pressure. And, you know, in in the lingo of singers, that takes it from head register into chest register. But more importantly, it just allows you to adjust the sound to appropriate levels for the song. But I'm saying if you start with a low volume first, you you come to believe your voice to be very agile. And that's so important of a belief to have as a foundation. It's that way when it becomes stiff or rigid, if something chokes off on you, you know that to be an aberration. You know you just got in the way of the flexibility of your instrument rather than thinking your instrument is unable. If you have a chronic habit of choking off notes just on the thought of singing one, then you can go to, you know, what's called a creaky door sound. And that'll take you into a more formal scale. You always want to work from the top down when exploring range. It's too easy to get caught in that restrictive thinking when we're ascending. So descending, I find to be far more useful. You could let that little, it's what that's doing is just pressing the folds together for a second. You're almost allowing the choke and then squeaking out of it. And then you'd work down from there. When you get to a certain area and your voice may crack, all that indicates is that there's an awkward exchange between the air pressure you're creating and the thickness of the fold that you're asking for. That's expected. If you've blocked off your voice for years, I wouldn't expect that to be a smooth transition, so you shouldn't either. It's going to take some practice, but you want to sew that together to get into that blend between areas of the voice so that you stop thinking of it in sections and just it's just one single connected sound. I can't stress enough how important it is to spend a disproportionate amount of time up in this thin, weightless area. It'd be great if we could all talk to each other like this. Then everybody would be singing high so easily. But of course, that's not how we speak to each other. So we spend all this time reinforcing the thick, rigid behaviors of of cultural speech and then wanting to fly free when we sing and that's just not going to happen unless you spend more time up there so again playful be really playful with your voice just make goofy cartoon sounds and then graduate that over or transfer that over to something more musical formal Just little scales will do, but keep it light, weightless, slippery. Don't load it up with volume yet. Don't ask for a big projected performance sound. Spend a lot of time trusting that the thought of a high note comes out slippery. Slowly after that, you can start to increase uh, the volume of your voice and ask for a little richer sound. I don't recommend telling yourself you're going to belt or extend your chest register, because those are are behavior programs that have built-in restrictions. And the one thing you don't want to do is to start loading up your thoughts again with restrictive beliefs. Then the real-life application of this approach is to, let's say you have a, a little part singing high in a song that's giving you trouble. 
you want to practice this at home in that light, sweet, tender voice over and over again because it'll allow you to keep your neck loose and your face loose and your jaw and your tongue. Then you want to apply it to the music, still in that light voice, singing high, singing high, and graduate the volume, but do so in very small increments. Singing high. Use your neck and your jaw as a gauge. If everything locks up on you, you're overdriving the voice. But if everything stays loose, then you're free to ask for as rich and loud a sound as the song deserves. Singing high. Now, if your voice chokes off when attempting something like that, then that's not a range issue, that's a power issue. And that, my friends, will be the topic of the next podcast. I'm Mark Baxter for voicecouncil.com.